My name is Chris Hasvold. I am the 2020 NSDCR president. Thank you for joining us. This is our fourth chit chat, as we call them. Um, so thank you again. It's another opportunity to learn some great things today. We're going to have a couple of great presenters. So just wanted to give you a heads up. It's going to be a little bit different today um, in that I have been in the meeting, the uh, standard forms meeting since nine o'clock this morning, and I had to jump out of that to get this started. And then once um, once our speakers start going, I'm going to turn it over to our esteemed CEO, Tommy Thompson, and he's going to take you guys through the, the rest. I'll moderate the rest of it. So um, I'm going to share my screen with you just for a second because I want to show you what I'm in the middle of right now. We're not going to talk about standard forms today. However, I want you to see that in June, these are all the scheduled releases. So we have several new forms, actually three new forms, several modifications. Um, some of them you can see here called silent, which we're just changing a word or two. Some of them are pretty good changes. So uh, I want to make sure that you take the opportunity in the next couple of weeks to attend one of our training classes, because as you can see, there's, there's a lot going on um, in standard forms. Speaking of that, I don't know if you've heard it or not, but the proposed RPA change, we were coming out with a big modification the first one in five years was supposed to go live in December. That's been postponed. A lot of reasons. Um, primarily the tenant laws that changed, the rent control laws that changed effective January 1st caused us to virtually change every one of the tenancy forms. Um, that's a lot to learn. And with the COVID-19, we've introduced, uh, I believe, six new forms in the last three weeks. And two of those have been changed twice already. So there's an awful lot being thrown at you. So we decided to postpone the RPA change until December 2021. So you have some, some time there. Okay. Um, also, before we get started, I want to make sure that you guys tune in next week. Next Friday at 10 o'clock, Art Carter is going to be here from CRMLS, going to talk about things that are going to change the way you input a listing. So in this format, kind of hard to do, but um, by a show of hands, how many of you have taken a listing? got a listing contract signed, but you don't enter it in the MLS right away within the two days, right? You're getting pictures, it's staging, whatever's being done, owners cleaning up the property. So you delay some period before it goes in the MLS. I imagine almost all of you have done that. Well, uh, on May 4th, the way that you input listings is gonna change substantially. So I strongly encourage all of you to make sure you tune in next Friday at 10 o'clock to hear about that. It's the coming soon. If you hear the word clear cooperation policy, that's what they're referring to. So that's going to be important that you do. Um, one more thing I wanted to talk about um, is, as I mentioned, um, this is the fourth edition of the Chit Chat. We have some great presenters today. You have Lawrence Yoon, who's the chief economist at NAR. He's a busy man. Uh, just came off of one call joining ours, so we appreciate that. And Christian Hoysrat, who is an NAR um, political expert. So Lawrence is gonna talk about numbers, and Christian's gonna talk about politics, but hopefully not the kind that gets you in trouble on social media or around the dinner table. It's gonna be all politics about our business, so, so you're in for a treat there. Um, if this is your first time in a Zoom meeting, um, don't be intimidated. It's a little bit different format than you might be used to doing with your family. Or, or how you see those. All of you, when you come in, are going to be muted. As we have over 100 people online, it just doesn't work to have everybody um, with the background noise and talking, so everyone comes in muted. So if you want to ask questions of the panelists, make sure you use the chat box. If you're using your computer, if you scroll your mouse down to the bottom, you'll see a chat there. You click and type in the message, and Tommy will be monitoring that and be able to relay those questions to our panelists. If you're using an iPad, Look up in the top right corner, I believe, there's the three dots, you click on that, and you can do the chat. A lot of the questions will be repetitive, so Tommy's gonna have to kind of filter those out and make sure that we don't ask the same question more than once, but uh, we'll try and get to every question that we can. First question I know it's gonna come up, is this being recorded? Yes. Our IT guru, uh, James Santillo, has created a, a terrific, easy way for you to find these videos. Uh, if you go to the search bar and you type in nsdcartv.com, that's nsdcartv.com, it takes you right to our NSDCR YouTube channel, 
where you can see not only this video, but the first three as well. So make sure you check in on those. And um, I believe that's about it. Um, so without further ado, uh, we're going to start with Lawrence Yoon. So Lawrence, you've, you've got the mic, it's all yours. And I'm gonna check out, I've gotta go back into my standard forums meeting. So Tommy's gonna take over from here on out. So from me to all of you, um, stay safe, stay healthy. Uh, thank you, Chris, uh, for inviting me. Uh, glad to be here uh, with the North San Diego Realtors. And let me uh, put the slide share because I have a few slides to share with you uh, for my talk. And then, okay. Uh, so I think you can see the slide. Uh, so um, you have heard the adjectives, the uncharted waters, unprecedented, uh, and certainly a, a very unique uh, event uh, in the US today uh, where we have this uh, economic lockdown. Uh, we hope uh, it ends soon you know, with the, uh, some vaccine discovery, or at least we can uh, open the economy in a safe way. Uh, we don't wanna have a repeat of the second wave and uh, another second lockdown, so we have to do it in a uh, measure safe way, but uh, the 2020 uh, certainly is facing a tremendous challenges all across the board. Uh, the economy, real estate market. Uh, this chart is the broadest measure of GDP. Uh, in the beginning of this chart, you see 08, 09, that is the Great Recession. Uh, Great Recession was the worst economic activity since the 1930s Great Depression. In the second quarter in 2020, the GDP is forecasted to be, I don't even make this forecast anymore because numbers are too wild, uh, minus 30% or minus 40%, something wildly off the chart negative in the second quarter. But the second quarter decline is a government imposed decline. It is due to the fact that all the small businesses need to shut down, non-essential activity uh, don't go out, uh, and therefore it is a government imposed shutdown. To compensate for this, which Christian, my uh, colleague from NAR, will speak more in detail, is this massive, massive stimulus bill. The spirit of the stimulus bill is to say that since people are losing jobs, it is not their fault. The economy was quite strong. The real estate mar market was quite strong pre-pandemic. And because government imposed the lockdown, people should not suffer uh, greatly from the consequence and hence the massive stimulus bill. There would be some level of inequities. Some people are able to tap the Small Business Administration loan rather easily, uh, while other people are clogged up in the bureaucracy uh, uh, part. For people who are unemployed, it is an enhanced unemployment benefit. Uh, I would encourage all realtors to tap into these resources temporarily because NAR lobby uh, hard to assure that realtors for the very first time would qualify for the unemployment insurance. Again, business activity was solid before the pandemic uh, and given that uh, it was government imposed lockdown and the spirit of the uh, stimulus bill is to replace the potential lost income, please tap into the resources during this uh, interruption. The third quarter, fourth quarter, second half of the year, GDP will be off the chart positive now, I cannot say it will be V-shaped. V-shaped will be where you go down steeply, but you rise back equally steeply. Uh, I don't think it will be that. But also, I don't think it will be a U-shape. A U-shape is you go down, stay down for a little while before coming back up. I think it's going to be in between. Some business activity will be coming back up 100% running. Uh, if you think about, say, hair salon business, dental offices, daycare centers, schools opening, uh, you will be back in business, you know, pretty much 100% right away. Cruise ship industry, it may take multiple years before people feel comfortable going on a cruise again, uh, unless the vaccine is discovered. Uh, 
So there are many unknowns, the, you know, the path of the virus, uh, the vaccine discovery, uh, but assuming that all the current situation of social distancing where people are becoming a little more comfortable going to the grocery store with a mask on, uh, gloves on, uh, which means that maybe they can open some small businesses where they can also allow people with social distancing to go. Uh, if the grocery shops are open, then why not Macy's uh, with social distancing? Uh, so people are not crowded up. So there could be some level of uh, opening up. And also I think people will closely monitor what's happening in Germany as they are opening up. You know, Europe is op uh, went through this virus crisis before us, and therefore they are opening their economy before us, which will give us some uh, examples. And also the state of Georgia, you know, what happens there uh, would be very uh, interesting. Um, but the 2020 overall, the GDP number will be negative. And uh, the second quarter being so negative, the positive number in the third and fourth quarter, I don't think we can compensate for the downfall. So we will uh, finish up with a negative figure uh, in 2020. Uh, let me see here, uh, the unemployment insurance situation, as you can see, has gone up just completely uh, off the uh, chart. So prior to the pandemic, it's just small little dot line. I'm not sure what that represents, whether it's 30,000 each week. And, uh, but then you see a sudden surge uh, to 3 million, then the 6 million next week, another 6 million. If there's any good news, number of new filers for the unemployment insurance claim is beginning to come down. Uh, if you use the analogy of the coronavirus, you know, who are getting it, one can say, you know, this is what the, which means we will begin to taper off. The number of cases of people who have the virus sort of flattening out, you can say the unemployment insurance is still rising because this is showing how many new people are coming in, but at least it's beginning to flatten out uh, because as number of new filer numbers are beginning to come down a bit. But these are still huge numbers uh, in terms of the uh, people who are filing for unemployment insurance. Uh, this is for the state of California. So you can see that in the uh, first two weeks, in a huge surge, uh, steadily declining in the following week uh, in terms of the new filers. Uh, some of the people who were unemployed in the first week, uh, they have found a job, so they have come off the roll. Maybe they found a job at Amazon, Costco. So there are a few industries that are still hiring, uh, but if you just add up this bar chart, you know, that's how many people who are uh, unemployed. Uh, I'd like to show you uh, this chart from New Orleans and uh, New York City. Uh, it is not San Diego or North San Diego, but trying to give you some ideas about uh, what may happen or at least just factual historical fact. You see the huge surge in New Orleans in terms of unemployment rate. It was 5% and suddenly rising to 16% before going down again. What was that about? Well, that was the Hurricane Katrina. Uh, Katrina came in, wiped it away. Uh, many of these small business owners, they had to shut down for several weeks. Uh, the travel did not come into New Orleans. Uh, so you can say very similar type of industry lost job briefly during the Hurricane Katrina. Why did the unemployment rates go down so fast? Massive disaster relief funding going into New Orleans. So in a sense that in the US today with the virus, uh, we have this massive stimulus. So we are still in a phase of rising unemployment rate, but given the size of the stimulus, is it possible uh, that once the economy steadily reopens, that people have the spending power to go into the economy? Uh, consider the enhanced unemployment check, um, the $600 additional from the federal government on top of what California would offer. And I believe on average, a uh, California uh, recipient on average uh, is something like $1,200 uh, per week, uh, per week, which means uh, $4,800 per month uh, in terms of unemployment check on average. Uh, some people who may have worked at a cashier job, uh, they may realize that unemployment check actually offer a little more than what they were earning at a, uh, working as a, say, starting wage at the cashier part. But other people are much worse off. The, the unemployment insurance is not fully replacing the income. But I just want to make the highlight that it is a massive stimulus. And furthermore, people who cannot pay mortgage about the mortgage forbearance, I'm, I'm sure Christian will go into that in a little more detail. The other chart on the New York City, 
uh, is the, um, if you look at the early part, that little smaller bump that you see at the beginning, that is the 9-11 tragic events. So when the September 11th events occurred, uh, the U.S. economy was already softening, but September 11th really pushed the U.S. economy into a recession. Uh, but it was a short recession, and then we came out of it. Uh, but for a few years, uh, unemployment rate really did not rise all that much. So it increased sort of and then stay at that level uh, before coming down. It was of short duration, uh, but also a massive disaster relief money went into the New York City. In both New Orleans and in New York City, after those disasters, home prices actually increased. So we often get a question today to say, uh, given what's happening to the economy currently, how should we prepare for what we experienced regarding foreclosures of 10 years ago? And also which impacted you know, realtors greatly. Well, we saw the membership numbers decline uh, dramatically during that time. So should we anticipate uh, something similar? And if New Orleans and New York City is an example, then we can say, well, home prices do not need to decline because home price decline of the Great Recession was not related to the disaster, halt, disaster event and halting of the economy, but it was more related to the subprime mortgages, people overstretching their budget, funny mortgages, uh, which we don't have anymore. So uh, we don't have those, uh, those easy uh, mortgage loans. Another difference today versus back in 2008 period is home builders went wild. They overproduced. I know that people in North San Diego may say, no, they don't produce enough. But if you look at the historical chart, uh, they were producing much more actively back in 08, 09, or I should say like, a couple of years preceding that. So there was an oversupply. So you had easy lending, which blew up, uh, combined that with oversupply, uh, and it was going to lead to home price declines. Uh, but right now, uh, we have a housing shortage pre-pandemic, and during the pandemic today, there is even fewer listings. So certainly a no oversupply, and with a mortgage forbearance in place, uh, no impending foreclosure situation. Uh, if the economy does not recover, say within the 12 months, then we could face foreclosure crisis as people that mortgage forbearance period ends, uh, unless they decide to extend that uh, a timeline. So the housing market has climbed out from that low point of disaster 2008, 2009 steadily, and uh, it's generally been uh, going up. And pre-pandemic, very healthy condition. Market was healthy, rising sales, prices holding on firmly. And if there was any challenge, it was lack of inventory and prices rising just too fast, too quickly uh, condition. But it was not driven by subprime lending it was driven by lack of inventory uh, situation. And here's the inventory chart uh, nationwide, uh, California market. I speak with Leslie Appleton Young frequently and she said, yeah, inventory shortage all across California. Uh, so this is what we face uh, in a pre-pandemic uh, period. Uh, so there is no concern of any uh, imminent price decline or any measurable continuous price decline. Only softness, I would say, maybe on the upper end market, but it was the case even before the pandemic uh, because of the tax reform and salt state and local income tax deduction limits. Uh, it hurt some of the high end market, unable to fully deduct mortgage interest or property taxes, uh, and therefore the upper end was somewhat soft, uh, but that was already pre pandemic. So during the pandemic, you may see some softness in the upper end market. Uh, and you combine that with a stock market uh, correction, which generally hurts the upper income bracket. Federal Reserve went all in quickly this time. Uh, in other occurrences, Federal Reserve, it took them about eight months to drop interest rates in a small increments. But this time, uh, the government recognizing uh, it is a severe government imposed lockdown, Federal Reserve went all in cutting interest rate essentially to zero on the Fed funds rate, which then drags down the 10-year treasury, which then will drag down the mortgage uh, interest rates. So here's the relationship between mortgage rates, blue line, and the treasury yield, which is the uh, red line. You can see it moves almost in a synchronized way, one-to-one -one, uh, sort of movements, except for the very end. 
if you see the very end, 10-year treasury has fallen below 1%. That's what we are today. Based on that, mortgage rates should be about 2.7%. So if we eventually return to the normal relationship, you can say there's an opportunity that mortgage rate may actually go down a little further in a few months. So that's a possibility. Now, one reason why it's still not falling, uh, even though it's already at low points, is that they said refi demand is so strong and the lenders don't have the uh, staffing to handle so many refi loans. So they want to keep the home purchase mortgages a little, uh, uh, put a little gate on that. And one way to put the gate is to put higher interest rates. So once the refinance activity begins to die down, uh, maybe then the interest rate uh, will go down. But the other part is that jumbo market or non-conforming mortgages that is not working. And clearly in North San Diego with so many million dollar homes, uh, this could be a, a, a very negative decisive factor uh, because people need to take out jumbo loans. But if the jumbo market is not working, uh, then it's gonna make it very difficult, especially on the luxury market uh, to function correctly. Why is it not working? Because of the mortgage forbearance. Uh, mortgage forbearance clearly needed you know, for people who are suddenly unemployed, they had a job, now uh, they cannot make mortgage payments, there's mortgage forbearance. But what this also means is that JP Morgan and other mortgage lenders, they are not receiving those mortgage payments. If they're not making, receiving those mortgage payments, but they still have to pay property taxes, homeowner insurance as part of the mortgage servicing duties, and also pay the Wall Street investors who have lent the money, uh, they're getting cash crunch. And as they're getting facing cash crunch, uh, they're saying for jumbo mortgages or non-conforming mortgages, they have to impose much higher credit standards, 20% down payment, much higher credit scores. Um, for loans that can be sold off to Fannie and Freddie, those mortgages are still uh, moving because you know, say JP Morgan originates the loan, they're selling off to Fannie and Freddie, no problem. Uh, so there's no cash issue uh, related to Fannie and Freddie back, uh, which is the reason why, say, uh, California Association constantly advocate for larger loan limit, higher loan limit, and the importance of Fannie and Freddie, which is NAR policy uh, that we communicate here in Washington. Uh, the home building activity I mentioned, you know, we have a housing shortage uh, because this chart clearly illustrates uh, the red line shows the historical average uh, activity. Uh, last time, overproduction. This time, multiple years of underproduction, uh, which was the reason why we had that inventory shortage. And building activity now during the pandemic is going down again. So as we come out of the pandemic, we could face even greater uh, potential housing shortage. Now, of course, there are people who are unemployed, so they are no longer in the housing market unless they recover the job quickly. Uh, but uh, probably about 70% of the people with job have a secure employment. And one thing they will be facing um, post pandemic is low interest rates. And also there will be more inventory beginning to show up because when we take survey of the uh, realtors about their potential clients, uh, they are indicating that they, the clients are just waiting for all clear signal from the governor. And if that's the case, they will list their property. And most of those listings are done so for the purpose of buying another property. They list to trade up, trade down, uh, move to slightly uh, different location. Uh, so people who are listing are also the buyers of homes also. But they are awaiting that all clear signal from the governor to reopen the economy. Quickly. We've been taking weekly flash survey of buyers and sellers. And first, uh, what is not shown in this chart is that both buyers and sellers are saying they want to come back once the economy reopens. So many people are not in the market today, but they want to come back uh, once it is formally uh, open. And also from buyers, they see the limited choices today. It doesn't excite them. They need to see more choices. This question here on the chart that you see is about home prices. So going to the seller side, on the right-hand side, that's easier. Are the home sellers panicking? Are they sensing unemployment and therefore they have to drastically reduce prices to uh, uh, find buyers? And there is no sense of panic among sellers at all. They're saying they are whatever price they had intended to list, 
that would be the price that will list that at, no lowering of the price. What about on the buyer's side? Well, 37% of the buyers do not expect lower price, 16% by less than 5%. So if you add up the orange and the yellow combined, uh, that's more than half of the people uh, with less than 5%. Because even in a normal market, buyers always want to offer a little below a list price, 98% of the list price and so forth. So you can say that you know the good majority are thinking the market will be normal. But you also see that some buyers think that could be a potential bargain opportunity. So there will be some degree of face off between sellers and buyers because buyers are sensing there could be a bargain. Maybe they will be disappointed because we don't have inventory and even more significant acute housing shortage uh, when the economy reopens and jobs are uh, coming back uh, conditions. Uh, stimulus, I'm gonna let uh, Christian uh, go over all the stimulus measures, uh, but how is the government funding all this unemployment check, uh, small business loans and everything? They are issuing debt, huge federal budget deficit. Who is buying this debt? Is it the Chinese, German pension fund? Who is buying this debt? Well, currently most of the debts are purchased by the Federal Reserve. Where is the Federal Reserve getting the money? They are printing money. Printing press is going to fund all this. If America was not America, printing of the money would lead to high inflation. But America is very fortunate to have this extraordinary privilege of having the US dollar. In a financial panic, financial uncertainty, people want the dollar. And because of that status, printing of the money will not lead to inflation, at least in the immediate years. But say five or six years from now, with so much printing of the money, will we face like 1970s style 7% inflation, 8% inflation? And if that's the case, some people want to have hedge against inflation. Some will want to buy gold as a hedge against inflation, but real estate has also shown to be a good hedge against inflation. So you may begin to see that in the future years that some people buy real estate as a good hedge against inflation. Remember, most people take out a fixed rate mortgage, which means that monthly payment remains the same even in the time of inflation. Real estate becomes a truly good value. Monthly payment uh, becoming very small because of inflation, but home value is rising. So we may see some of the extra real estate demand in the future years with so much of the printing of the money. This is my final chart. Forecast, first I'm gonna put the caveat, highly uncertain but this is my best estimate at the moment. You know, believe me, it's gonna be off, but here's my estimate. The second quarter, extremely ugly. Third and fourth quarter, positive, but unable to make up for the loss that we experienced in the second quarter. So 2020 will be, will be down about 3% GDP. That correlates to about 4 million job losses, uh, which means that this huge number of job losses that you are seeing recent weeks, many people will return to their job. So it's not that they, uh, so it will be about 4 million job losses. Translating into home sales declining about 10%. I am more inclined to say 10% decline rather than 5% decline. Uh, and home prices remaining steady on a nationwide basis. Uh, then going into 2021, things should be positive. We had a pent up housing demand, but assuming that economy can catch the momentum for growth, it will lead to now positive job creation. Uh, and home sales, uh, that pent up demand uh, will play and home prices uh, beginning to rise uh, again, once again. So uh, with that, uh, thank you for your patience and I will stop here and stop sharing. And thank you, that. Lawrence, will you entertain a couple questions for us? Uh, sure thing. Um, before we get to Christian, um, actually I'm, they're coming in right now, but quick question um, about the presentation. So everyone knows we will have this presentation um, on our, our YouTube page, but you can get there through nsdcrtv.com and you can review everything Lawrence has put up. Um, can you share those slides separately, Lawrence? Is that something you're willing to do? Uh, you are most welcome to share uh, the slides. Uh, right. In fact, let me send you a one updated slide. Uh, right after this, I'm talking to Arizona Realtors. Uh, the thing about Zoom is that I can travel across the country in a second. Um, is uh, that there is one slide with Arizona data rather than California data. So let me just change that and then send the updated uh, chart 
to you, and then you can distribute to people who are uh, attending the Zoom meeting. Great. Well, you covered everything so well, Lawrence Farris. Appreciate it. I don't have any further questions uh, from our group. Um, so we want, on behalf of NSDCR, North, uh, Cal North San Diego County Real Realtors, we're very grateful that you came. And um, we, we paired Lawrence with Christian pur purposely because uh, they are a great pair. Um, as we get into Christian, um, his presentation uh, focuses a lot on the relief, and I'll, I'll let him actually give the presentation. But I just want to say, I, I actually don't know where Christian resides, but if, if, if I would, would, were to bet, I'd say San Diego somewhere because he's everywhere uh, for NAR, and we see him in California a lot, and uh, he's, he's our representative, and uh, he gives us great information. So Without uh, further delay, I'd like to introduce uh, Christian uh, Hoysrad. Christian? Hey, thanks so much, Tommy. I'm going to go ahead and uh, share my screen as well with folks. I think that's up there. All right. How's that looking? Looking good, Tommy? Yes, it looks great. All right. Awesome. Well, uh, thank you again. Hi, everybody. Um, so uh, I serve as NAR's uh, political representative for California. Um, so I am the primary liaison between NAR and our state and local associations um, in a number of states, in, including California. And so uh, essentially, I'm, I'm kind of serve as the, the person who provides updates on, on what NAR is doing in, in DC uh, to benefit all of you. And so uh, over the last month, you all should know that, you know, since this crisis began, our policy team and, and lobby teams have been working around the clock uh, with policymakers here in Washington to make sure uh, that uh, all of our members uh, would be, uh, would uh, receive benefits through these relief packages coming down the pike in Congress. And so we've been constantly advocating um, to, to make sure that independent contractors, self-employed folks would be eligible for all of these benefits uh, included in, in uh, these stimulus packages. So um, I'll preface this by saying I'm, gonna, I'm about to throw a lot of information at all of you, and I know it can feel a bit overwhelming, but um, you, should, you should know that all of uh, what I'm about to say is actually up in writing at nar.realtor slash coronavirus. Um, and so you'll find all of, uh, all of our resources that you can look through, you can download, um, all available there. But I'll also um, give a, a quick shout out to um, CAR's coronavirus uh, website as well, car.org slash coronavirus. They also have excellent um, FAQs with California specific information um, with regard to uh, unemployment, for example, and that type of thing. So um, those are probably the, the two main spots you want to head to. And if you just want to have the, the URL in your phone for NAR, you can text COVID-19 to 30644 and uh, it'll respond with the, uh, with the address um, for our coronavirus microsite. So um, in terms of what we'll cover today, uh, basically uh, most of this was included in what was called the CARES Act. Um, otherwise known as the economic stimulus bill that was passed on March 27th. This was a $2.2 trillion piece of legislation, um, the largest ever in American history. It's almost 900 pages long. And so I'll tell you that, you know, our policy staff is still um, requesting and receiving clarification and guidance from some of the, the federal agencies that are overseeing uh, these benefit programs. So um, what I'm going to do today is I'm going to kind of pull out from that 900 page document the highlights of, of what I think will be of most benefit um, to our members and most benefit to your businesses. So um, we're going to talk about relief for individuals, home buyers, and renters. I'm going to give a little information about what we've been doing in Washington to make sure that the home buying and, and selling process um, has, you know, can has continued in, in as uh, little disruption as, as possible and despite the conditions. I'm gonna talk about relief for um, independent contractors and, and small businesses most prominently. That'll include the pandemic unemployment um, assistance as well as the two big SBA loans that folks are talking about, the pay tech, uh, Paycheck Protection Program, PPP, and the Economic Injury Disaster Loans, or EIDL. Um, I'll also touch real quickly on, on some relief for commercial real estate we've been able to acquire. And then I'll give a preview in terms of kind of what we expect to be coming down the pike in Congress. And then I also want to make sure folks are aware of um, our Right Tools Right Now initiative 
um, that has been launched to uh, uh, provide uh, benefits during this crisis uh, for our members. So um, we'll start here with uh, our uh, relief for individuals. Um, so uh, probably the, the most prominent piece of the stimulus bill that folks have been hearing about are, are the stimulus checks, those $1,224 checks that have either already been deposited into bank accounts or will be uh, 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 pr provided via check uh, in the mail here in the weeks ahead. Um, there's some student forbearance um, included, uh, student loan forbearance included in the CARES Act, credit score protection, early retirement withdrawal options, and I'll also touch on the tax deadline extension. So first and foremost, um, these, this is sort of the breakdown of the, of the stimulus checks. So basically anyone who uh, in, in 2019 made $75,000 or less in terms of adjusted gross income, they uh, received the full $1,200 check. And then there's a sliding scale between 75,000 and those who made $99,000 last year. Um, uh, those folks will receive uh, reduced amounts um, in, in stimulus. And so the formula is $5 um, less for every $100 in income above 75,000 up to 99. So um, that's, that's for individual filers, for married couples and joint filers. Um, those folks are eligible for $2,400 checks up to uh, $150,000 in adjusted gross income. And again, there's a cap at $198,000 for couples and um, the, the reduced check, check amounts will, will fall within um, that, that threshold of, of income. And then for head of household filers, these are usually single, single parents. Um, the uh, adjusted gross income threshold is $112,500. Um, and then again, there's a sliding scale of, of check amounts up to $136,500. Um, and then for both joint filers and head of household filers, um, uh, those folks would receive an additional $500 for every child under the age of 17. Um, so about 80 million Americans received direct deposits uh, in their bank accounts last Wednesday. Um, and uh, for those who received their uh, refund checks last year by mail, um, checks will be mailed out from the Treasury Department, hopefully within the, the next couple weeks here. Um, you should know that uh, when these discussions were happening in, in Washington, the, the primary conversations were around W-2 wage earners and NAR and our industry partners uh, pushed aggressively to make sure that 1099 uh, filers would be eligible. So hopefully these stimulus checks will be a benefit to, to our membership across the country. Um, also included in the CARES Act is another relief option is a, uh, a, a stop of payment on student loans. So the CARES Act allows you to suspend um, your payments on federal student loans for uh, up to six months. So, so through the end of, of this September, um, no interest will accrue during that time. And also that the, the CARES Act, I should mention, actually provides a credit score protection uh, for up to 120 days after the end of the national emergency. So essentially, if any type of individual is, is, take, is uh, taking advantage of of any type of, of forbearance, whether it's with their student loans or their mortgage, um, then the furnisher uh, must report that customer as current, again, through 120 days after the end of the national uh, emergency. So, so that's a helpful provision there. Um, another option for, for folks is taking an early retirement withdrawal without having to incur the 10% early withdrawal penalty. And so uh, our members could potentially take up to $100,000 um, without incurring the 10% the early withdrawal penalty. Um, and then uh, they can, uh, you know, they, they can either uh, recontribute um, those funds over the course of the next three years, um, or they can keep the money, uh, money and pay the tax on the withdrawals over the course of a three year period. Um, so those are, are some relief options for, for individuals. And I'll just also mention that uh, the IRS did uh, end up releasing gu uh, release guidance that has extended um, the tax deadline to July 15th, um, both for regular filers as well as quarterly estimated filers. And so um, for, for those who do file quarterly, both the first and second quarter um, uh, deadlines are now July 15th, whereas a couple weeks ago, the second quarter was actually going to be due before the first quarter, but um, we were able to, to get the IRS to provide clarity on that. So you all have until uh, July 15th to, to pay your taxes, which is, uh, which is a good thing. 
Um, in terms of relief for homeowners and renters, what I'm about to talk about um, applies to federally backed mortgages. So um, that's about 65% of, of uh, mortgages across the country. And, uh, and you should just know that uh, there is obviously a, a difference between federally backed mortgages and, and mortgages provided by um, you know, private servicers. So um, I, uh, with regard to homeowners with federally backed mortgages, and again, I'm talking about Fannie, Freddie, HUD, VA, um, those homeowners can request up to uh, six months forbearance to start under the CARES Act with extensions up to another six months. So that's a 360 days of deferred payment. So essentially anyone with a federally backed mortgage could potentially um, defer payments for, for up to a year. Um, renters in a property with these loans can also request relief from eviction for 120 days. And then uh, for our multifamily owners or landlords uh, who have federally backed loans, uh, they also may request uh, relief for up to 90 days. Um, uh, in terms of forbearance. Now you'll see there, there's a bit of a, a discrepancy between um, renters being able to take advantage of 120 days of relief from eviction versus that of uh, landlords only having 90 days of, of potential forbearance. So um, that's a problem in, in, uh, from NAR's perspective and something that, that we have brought to light uh, among congressional leaders. And so uh, we're hoping to bring parity to that relief, um, hopefully here within uh, some of the other pieces of legislation coming down the pike in Congress. Um, and then the last thing I'll just say on, on any type of mortgage forbearance, um, you should make very clear to your family, your clients, forbearance does not equal forgiveness. Um, if you take forbearance, you are going to have to pay those, those payments back. And so um, first and foremost, they, anyone who wants forbearance, you need to actually call and request it from your servicer. And then while you're requesting that forbearance, we highly encourage you to uh, address the repayment options up front. For any federally backed mortgages, Fannie and Freddie have already provided guidance to allow for um, options other than that of a lump sum at the end of the forbearance. And so again, uh, if anyone with a federally backed mortgage should be offered um, other, other type of, of uh, potential loan modifications, such as tacking those missed payments onto the end of the loan term. But um, anyone who wants forbearance, wants to take advantage of the repayment options, they need to contact their services directly. Um, I should also mention before I go on to the next thing that uh, Governor Newsom in uh, California um, actually was able to, uh, I believe, uh, acquire um, commitments from four of the five uh, big banks as well as 200 state chartered banks and lenders um, to provide at least 90 days forbearance uh, for non-federally backed mortgages. So essentially in the state of California, um, anyone with, uh, with, a, with a mortgage has some type of relief hopefully coming their way. I will just note though that in terms of um, the, the non-federal uh, serv uh, federally backed servicers, um, they have discretion over rep repayment options. So they may very well just request a lump sum payment after that forbearance. So just something to be mindful of. Um, in terms of actually conducting your, your business as Realtors, um, we at, at NER are encouraging folks to pay close attention to not only your state guidance, but also um, your local kind of re regulations and restrictions. And I know in California, it gets confusing. You've got, you got national, you've got state, you've got county, and then you've got <laughs> sometimes city. So um, again, just uh, make sure you're, you're paying attention to both your state and local associations for guidance in terms of how to actually conduct your business, open houses, that type of thing. I will say NAR does have some uh, open house uh, resources available at ner.realtor.coronavirus um, as well. Um, in terms of uh, federal lending, um, everyone should be aware that in, when it comes to federally backed mortgages, neither Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac have made any changes to credit scoring or down payment requirements. The only change that they've actually made for borrowers is to actually allow for more flexibility in how a lender can verify employment, which I'll get to in a second. Um, now we are hearing that there are some individual lenders and banks that are adding their own higher standards on these products. But again, those are not, that's not the FHFA uh, or FHA. That's, those are, those are individual private lenders. Um, and, and so, you know, just, you're, you have to kind of, um, you know, differentiate between the two um, in terms of providing any type of guidance to your, to your uh, family or, or clients. So, um, just be aware of, of those requirements there. And again, with regard to the Fannie and Freddie, 
Um, federal loans will now allow oral or email verification of employment. Um, and we've also worked very hard to make sure that um, all of the federal servicers um, are allowing for appraisal alternatives. So um, we got Fannie, Freddie, uh, the VA, all to allow for external appraisals um, and, uh, and desktop appraisals as well. So that was something that, that we worked on real early on back in March to make sure that um, that home selling and buying could, could hopefully continue uh, without disruption. Um, and so that's sort of, that, that's kind of the relief for individuals and, and, and helping make sure that uh, your businesses uh, can, can kind of continue. Um, and now I'm gonna talk a, a bit about what actual relief has been secured through the CARES Act um, for independent contractors specifically and, and small businesses. So we'll start with um, the pandemic unemployment benefits. Um, as you are probably aware, uh, independent contractors typically are not uh, eligible for unemployment insurance. Um, and so what the CARES Act did was it uh, basically created a new program called the Pandemic Unemployment Assistance Program um, so that independent contractors and self-employed individuals um, would be eligible for unemployment relief. So this is a temporary federal program. Um, the federal government provides the funding and the states administer the unemployment compensation. Um, now, the issue with that is because the states have never had to issue unemployment compensation to independent contractors and self-employed folks. Um, it's been, it's taken a little bit of time for them to get um, new applications and, and online processes up, up and running. Um, and so that's why, for example, in California, um, your, your uh, ability to apply for this assistance isn't exactly up and running yet, but I'll, I'll, I'll get to that in a second. Um, just know that the, the PUA program, though, uh, does provide for up to 39 weeks of unemployment assistance through the end of this year. Um, and in, that includes a $600 injection of, of benefits um, to all people who uh, are seeking unemployment benefits, not just independent contractors, but anyone um, on the unemployment rolls, uh, $600 per week uh, through July 31st to help get through the, the immediate part of this crisis. So in California, the Employment Development Department um, has announced that they will start taking online uh, PUA applications next Tuesday, the 28th. Um, they've also said, uh, according to your Secretary of Labor, um, that these benefits, as soon as you apply and are approved, are going to be paid within 24 to 48 hours of application. Now, typically, it's anywhere from a week to three week process for the normal um, unemployment application process. So uh, California is attempting to expedite this to get this relief out as, as fast as possible. Um, because of that, expedi that, that expedited uh, processing, though, um, they are going to provide these payments in uh, phases. So initial benefit payments will likely be the minimum amounts um, and uh, retroactive to your first date of unemployment as far back as the week of February 2nd. And then from the week of March 29th on, which is when the CARES Act was passed, they're going to start, they're going to tack on an additional $600 onto that benefit. And then going forward, the, the EDD is going to work to develop income verification procedures to determine if individuals are, higher for, are, are eligible for higher payments, which again would all be retroactive to your first date um, of eligibility or your, your first date of unemployment. So CAR is still recommending that realtors who are just independent contractors um, should wait for the EDD to launch their application. Uh, online application uh, next Tuesday before applying. Um, if you do have um, some kind of W-2 income, um, then you should probably just go ahead and apply uh, uh, through the, the current system as it is. Um, and then uh, the EDD will, will likely figure out how to then add your, your, uh, your independent contractor benefits on top of that. So just know though um, that the, the assistance is on its way. Folks will be able to apply next Tuesday and the amounts will be retroactive to uh, your first date of unemployment. Um, hey, so Christian, now I'm gonna talk about the two, uh, the two big SBA loan programs. And you should know as I'm talking about this, it's probably gonna be super confusing. I apologize for that. But um, NAR has launched a, uh, a video at our NAR.realtor coronavirus site, um, Secure Your Business Through the CARES Act. 
It's actually a great video that features Erin Stackley from our policy team. And she is gonna, she walks you through step-by-step step the differences between um, the Paycheck Protection Program and the Economic Injury Disaster Loans. Similar to what I'm going to do, she just does it better because she's she's the expert on all this. So if, uh, if I talk too fast or you're not really understanding kind of the ins and outs of the loans, please refer back to that video. Um, watch Aaron's ex explanation. And if you're still completely unclear, um, I'll have my contact info for everyone at the end in case you have questions. So um, essentially the, what the CARES Act did was it injected uh, $360 billion into the Small Business Administration. Normally on an average year, the Small Business Administration or SBA is charged with uh, lending about $30 billion in, in, in loans to small businesses per year. Um, when the CARES Act was passed on March 27th, uh, the federal government, the Congress and president directed the SBA to basically learn how uh, to basically implement uh, 10 times the amount of lending um, that they've ever done in the course of two weeks. And so uh, that partially accounted for what was a, a very rocky rollout of applications, especially for the Paycheck Protection Program. Some of that has smoothed out, but because that smoothed out, that means more people are applying. And so um, the funding um, was depleted uh, about a, a week and a half ago. However, the good news is the, the president is about to sign a bill today that will replenish that funding so that on Monday, the SBA will begin processing these loans again. So I'm gonna walk you through kind of the differences and, and purposes of both the PPP and the EIDL loans. Um, so uh, first you should know for, for both, um, both loans, um, businesses with 500 employees or less are eligible, including independent contractors uh, and sole proprietors. So um, again, this is, uh, this is a program by the way that we worked closely with US Senator Susan Collins from Maine who wrote the small business uh, portion of the CARES Act. Uh, we actually worked directly with her staff to write the language in the bill that made uh, independent contractors and self-employed people eligible. They had an initial draft. We didn't think it was broad enough. And so we rewrote it and the language NAR's policy team wrote is actually included in the bill. And so, um, you know, again, this is just another example of us working directly with Congress to make sure that our members have been taken care of. Um, so again, all of our members are eligible for these PPP and EIDL loans. Um, the Paycheck Protection Program loans, for its name, is basically intended to uh, cover payroll expenses um, for businesses so that they can maintain employees and, and keep paying them uh, during the time of this crisis. Whereas the EIDL loans, they're, they're really meant to um, provide uh, like uh, assistance to cover working capital needs, overhead, that type of thing. Um, and so uh, you should know that um, it, with, with both of these programs, the, the EIDL loans, um, th that was an already existing program. Um, so you're gonna apply directly through the sba.gov website, whereas the PPP is a brand new program created by the CARES Act. And so you have to apply through, through a lender. So just be aware of that. Now, um, the, the great thing about these loans is that, is that there are for, forgivable portions um, as long as you meet um, certain uh, requirements and, and standards. So on the PPP side of things, the loan formula is two and a half times um, a business's average monthly payroll up to $10 million. Um, businesses and independent contractors must provide lenders with documentation to back up their loan calculation. Um, now, for, uh, for the, the PPP side of things, um, the loan becomes forgivable for, for example, brokers with employees. The loan is forgivable um, if 75% of the loan is used towards payroll costs and other SBA criteria met. So basically payroll or uh, mortgage interest, rent, utilities, that type of thing. As long as the loan is applied at, but to those things, your full PPP loan is forgivable for brokers with employees. For independent contractors, the forgivable portion of a PPP loan is limited to eight weeks of your 2019 net income, okay? So essentially, a independent contractor or a realtor uh, without employees can apply for a loan up to two and a half times your average monthly payroll but the only forgivable portion of that is going to be your, your eight weeks um, uh, of net income
from 2019. So you can get the full loan up to two and a half times your monthly payroll, but only a certain portion of it is going to be forgivable. So if you just want a forgivable loan, you're only going to want to request eight weeks of your 2019 income. And so the way to figure that all out is you need to uh, contact an SBA 7A approved lender. Uh, I'd recommend starting with uh, a lender with whom you already have a relationship. Um, preferably a lender with whom you have a business account um, because we have heard banks are prioritizing people with business accounts. So you want to start there. If they aren't taking PPP applications, um, then SBA has a, a lender portal match on their website. You go in, put in your zip code, and it'll show all the PPP 7A approved lenders in your area. Um, so that's, that's PPP. Um, and then again, if you want the full loan outside of just their forgiveness, um, it's going to be a, a low interest loan at the at a fixed interest rate of one percent um and payments are deferred uh for the first six months and the, i think the loan terms are two years on the eidl side of things um so these loans like i said are from an already existing program you can request a loan up to fifteen thousand dollars the cares act provided for uh cash advances up to ten thousand dollars for small businesses, but you should, uh, and those cash advances would be forgivable if used for the intended purposes of uh, rent, mortgage payments, overhead costs, etc. But for realtors and independent contractors, you need to know that the the forgivable cash advance is limited uh, to a thousand dollars per employee. So if you're just an independent contractor without without employees, you're just limited to that thousand dollars. Um, in, in a forgivable advance, and then you can request a larger loan for 15, up to $15,000. And again, uh, that conventional loan is 3.75% uh, interest rate, and uh, you can defer payments for up to a year. Um, uh, so uh, that um, <laughs> is a, a lot of information I know, and, and this is kind of just a, a summary here. Um, th this infographic, by the way, is also available at, at nar.realtor slash coronavirus. One of the most frequently asked questions I get is, can I, can I apply and get both a PVP and an EIDL loan? The answer is yes, but you should be aware that both loans need to be applied towards uh, different uh, types of expenses. Um, and in order uh, for them, for those expenses, the expenses, in order for the loan to be forgivable, the expenses need to be within the, the criteria for both loans. And if you do get an EIDL cash advance, it's going to be subtracted from the forgivable portion of your PPP loan. So um, again, we have a great video online that you can go and watch if you need clarity. Um, and then all this information, again, is on uh, the NAR.Realtor Coronavirus website. Um, since the funding ran out, for uh, both loans a week and a half ago. Um, we, NAR has provided guidance on sort of how people should proceed. So if you've already applied for an EIDL loan, um, the SBA is processing them on a first come first serve basis. So you do not need to reapply if you've already done that for EIDL. If you have not already applied, you wanna go back to the SBA application page uh, once the funding is replenished, um, which will be today which means the SBA will probably reopen on Monday. So um, you'll have to go directly to that website. If you've already applied for a PPP loan through an SBA lender, but haven't been approved, you need to check with your lender to make sure that you're still in the queue. Um, otherwise you, you might have to reapply, depend, it depends on the, the lender. And then if you haven't applied yet, um, again, you should start preparing um, an application for when um, the SBA opens this process back up, hopefully on Monday. And you should know that even if you haven't filed your 2019 taxes yet, um, the, the application for a PPP loan will require you to fill out a, a form 1040 schedule C. So just be prepared for that um, in, in getting ready to, to apply for a PPP. But again, the best thing to do is to reach out to a, a lender for, for guidance. So I know I've been talking a lot, so I'm gonna wrap this up here real quick. For com commercial real estate folks, um, you should know that uh, we were able to secure some deadline relief um, from the IRS. So for anyone who's involved in a like-kind exchange with deadlines that fell between April 1st and July 15th, all those deadlines, the 45-day and 180-day deadlines are now pushed to July 15th. Same for those engaging in opportunity funds and opportunity zones. Um, the 180-day deadline, um, if it fell between April 1st and July 15th, has now been pushed to um, as late as July 15th. And for anyone who's in commercial real estate, perhaps a property manager, um, the Institute for Real Estate Management has a terrific pandemic guide for property managers. Highly recommend checking that out.
coming down the pike in Congress, as I said, uh, the additional CARES Act funding um, was passed by the House of Representatives yesterday afternoon. It's $484 billion more um, for these programs, including $310 billion for the Paycheck Protection Program. Um, I had mentioned uh, for, for people applying for BBP, they should go to a lender with whom you already have a business account. I know many of you don't have business accounts with lenders. So um, what the what Congress did was they actually have now set aside $60 billion for smaller lenders, um, including community banks, to allow for better access for, say, independent contractors and self-employed people to actually apply for these PPP loans if they don't already have a business account. So um, that was something that Congress heard very loud and clear from NAR, and so they were able to kind of carve out that bit of funding to allow for, for better access for our members. Um, another uh, uh, $60 billion uh, has been set aside for the EIDL loans, and then uh, the remaining funds are, are uh, related to healthcare hospitals and also another $25 billion for uh, COVID-19 testing. Um, in future legislation coming down from Congress, we are also going to um, advocate for remote notarization. California is one of the 27 states that currently does not allow for remote notaries. Um, and so the provisions we're advocating for uh, would uh, enact uh, uh, on, uh, remote online notarization for the duration of the national emergency so that virtual closings could occur. Um, and then after the end of the national emergency, it would sunset and states would have to go and pass their longer term pieces of legislation. So that's something we're working on. I already mentioned we're trying to bring parity relief for landlords versus renters. And then uh, we are also uh, asking that Congress include eligibility for 501c6 uh, uh, organizations um, for the PPP program. So that's basically uh, all our state and local associations for the most part are 501c6 um, associations. And we want to make sure that they're eligible for some relief as well. And finally, I'll just mention here the Right Tools Right Now initiative. Um, if you go to nar.realtor, um, you'll, you'll see the link for Right Tools Right Now on there. This initiative makes um, new and existing NAR products and services available for free or at significant discounts. These are webinars to help manage your finances, education courses, um, market reports, etc. And also, if your current healthcare plan does not provide for virtual healthcare, um, NAR is now giving uh, all of our members up to two months free um, access to members telehealth, uh, which provides around the clock uh, virtual access to non-emergency healthcare. And so that's something to definitely take advantage of if your healthcare plan already doesn't have it. And then um, after your two months runs out, we've actually negotiated a, a low um, subscription rate of $7 per month to members telehealth for you to continue with it thereafter. You just have to register by May 30th. And lastly, NAR does have a COVID-19 hotline, 1-800-874-6500. Um, however, if you call and you get put in a queue, I'm always here uh, as a, as a uh, resource for you. So um, again, this is all my, my, my uh, contact info. Email me, call me, text me. I consider myself a concierge to NAR for all of you. I want to try to, to assist you and, and your businesses as, as best as that I can. So if I can't answer a question for you, I can hopefully find someone that will. So, so please don't hesitate to reach out. And with that, I will stop sharing my screen and uh, take some questions from folks. Uh, Christian, so before we pass it to Chris to close this, because we're, we're beyond the hour mark here, but yeah. there was a lot of questions about the EIDL and how they can qualify, but at what, amount, at what amounts they can qualify at. Um, there was a screen you had, I think it showed where they can go to uh, get more information on that. Did you have a, yep. a slide for that? Yeah, um, I think uh, for, if, if you want more information on the EIDL, the best place to go um, would be uh, nar.realtor slash coronavirus. Um, if you go there um, and click on political advocacy, you'll, they'll see there's a frequently asked questions sheet um, on both SBA loan programs and includes from NAR all eligibility, how to apply those types of things. And, and that's probably the best resource. And if you don't find your answers there, uh, it, that, that site also links directly to the SBA website. Okay. Excellent. And I want to thank you, Christian. Chris, do you want to close us out here? I see him, but uh, I don't know if he's still there. Okay, well, 
Thanks again, Christian. We appreciate you spending time with us. And, um, and uh, thank you, everyone, for joining our chit chat. The next one is next um, is on Friday, a week from today at 10 o'clock, uh, 10 a.m. It's Art Carter, and uh, he'll be going over the clear cooperation and a lot of things that you need to know about that. So a very important chit chat next week. Um, before uh, we begin that clear cooperation period. Um, and it's actually that same day, that same weekend. So it's opportune for us to have art here. Um, and again, thanks everyone and we'll sign out. Thanks everybody.